Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Claire. Welcome to the ninth session in our Charmwood Forest Species Identification and Recording Series, this one on spring flowers. Just a few points of housekeeping. Um, uh, we are recording the session, so it will go on our YouTube channel later on. Um, if you could perhaps pop yourselves on mute, please, uh, and then we won't get any feedback um, during the talk. Um, happily unmute at the end uh, when we have our time for questions. You're welcome to have your video camera on or off. That's completely up to you. Uh, and as ever, we'll aim to end by um, around two o'clock. So there will be time for questions at the end. Um, if you put anything in the chat box, just note I can't necessarily see it until we get to the end, but do feel free to use that or save up your, um, your questions and we will um, get to them at the end. Just going to stop my video to make sure that um, we get as much bandwidth as possible uh, and avoid any of the disturbance that might happen. Okay, so that is hopefully enough of the boring housekeeping uh, and we will just get on uh, with the presentation. Um, we're just starting with a reminder about the project. Um, we haven't covered this for a couple of sessions, so um, I just wanted to remind everybody. Why are we here? Why do we want to identify and record species? Well, first and foremost, recording is all, all about being a, a management tool. Um, so we can check the health of habitats and species uh, and decide whether the management that's happening is correct or needs to be changed, um, or whether there's other things at play um, that we need to look into. So it is, it's, it's a real health check if certain species are thriving or not. Um, it can be an indication of, of what's going on around us, um, an indication of climate as well. Um, so um, that's um, um, one of the reasons that we would do it. Now, currently in the Charwood Forest, um, there are some species records, it sounds a lot, 13,800, um, but we'd love to have loads more. Uh, and at the moment, it's a small group of committed, brilliant volunteers um, but we'd like to increase that if possible, get more records um, that will just give us really valuable information about this important area. And just as a reminder, um, we've started off these, these sort of series of sessions um, at the beginner level. So the Zooms that we've been doing over the last um, eight months or so have been quite a beginner level um, to hopefully get everybody interested and on board with um, a range of different species. As we move through, we'll be going towards more intermediate sessions um, and then hopefully um, people will start to feel as though they might be more experienced. You'll note that I haven't put expert at the end there. I think if you talk to anyone who's been doing identification and recording, um, very few will consider themselves experts. Um, everybody always has more that they can learn. Um, so it's all about experience and getting out and about. So what we're hoping is to give you some of the tools uh, and skills on these sessions uh, and the sessions that will be coming up throughout the summer um, to get you towards that intermediate level uh, that you can then combine with hopefully getting out and about uh, and building your level of experience and your level of confidence. So today we're on Zoom. Uh, the uh, April session will also be on Zoom, but then from May we're hoping to have some field-based sessions, um, which is what we were all hoping to do. But obviously recent events have put pay to that somewhat but we are looking forward to getting out into the field and doing some more intermediate sessions over the summer. And just a reminder um, that you can um, see a bit more about the wider scheme um, through the uh, link on our website, where Julie Attard, the scheme manager, um, gives you a bit of a rundown. It's a whole landscape partnership scheme sponsored, um, funded by the National Lottery. And there's lots of other opportunities to maybe get involved in different elements of the scheme. Um, but as Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust, we are leading uh, on this particular one, along with a couple of others, um, particularly aimed uh, at wildlife and conservation. OK, so on to the main um, meat and drink of the session, if you like, um, the, the session on spring flowers and also signs of spring. I wanted to have a bit of a broader approach uh, as well as giving you some ID tips for some of the flowers um, and flowering plants that you're going to see um, over the coming weeks and months. But before I start with that, um, I just wanted to almost take a step back uh, and probably um, say the opposite of what I've just been saying about identifying and recording species. And just take a moment to remind everybody uh, and remind myself really that actually enjoying wildlife and getting out in the spring um, isn't all about knowing exactly what it is you're seeing. Uh, and just don't forget to take the time to think about what you're hearing, what can you see, what can you smell, uh, and just enjoy it. I know when I've been out on my walks recently, and starting to think, oh, spring's in the air, it makes me feel much better. And 
I'm not too worried if I don't know quite yet um, what leaves are, what leaves are appearing, what blossom I'm seeing. Uh, just try and enjoy it um, as much as possible. Um, enjoy being out and about. Enjoy that kind of refreshed kind of new start for the new year. Um, so lots of things that will help us identify signs of spring. So birds singing, um, frogs maybe if you're lucky enough to have a pond and you've got any frogs in there. Um, they might, you might hear them croaking at night if you've got the window open. Uh, you might be starting to see the buds bursting uh, and possibly smelling uh, blossom as you're kind of walking through. Um, there's a particular um, lane where, near where I live. That I walk through this kind of canopy of blossom and the smell is amazing at this time of year. So just out and about enjoying signs of spring. Um, and then you can take it that bit further and start to think, right, okay, now I want to try and um, think about identifying some of these species. One of the first signs of spring um, I've certainly come across, I set myself a little task a couple of weeks ago to go out and see what I could spot and what signs of spring could I spot um, and, and take some photographs so that I could pop them into this presentation and, and hopefully um, give you that kind of real world and this is what's going on at the moment. And one of the first signs is often bulbs. Uh, this was a lovely display and the photo really doesn't do it justice of snowdrops um, out at our Charmwood Lodge Nature Reserve. And then that was a different woodland setting and started to see clumps of what I know will be bluebells coming through. Um, so it's that signs of things to come, um, not just the stuff that's in flower now, but thinking ahead um, to the things that will come. So enjoying the snowdrops now and, and looking ahead to bluebells, which won't be very long away. And just a note on bluebells, um, they can be a bit tricky to identify because there are hybrid species um, and there are Spanish bluebells and native bluebells. Um, so the photo on the left there with the drooping head um, is possibly familiar if you're in any of our kind of more ancient woodlands, uh, and that is the native bluebell. So you're looking out for this drooping head um, with quite slender, um, long um, bells um, on the head and quite a pale, um, pale colour with a bit of that kind of hint of lilac. The photo on the right is hybrid um, bluebells, and that's a hybrid between our native and the Spanish um, bluebell, which was introduced. And you can see the stems are very upright and the bells are kind of spread out at all different angles. You don't get that drooping over. Um, they're a bit shorter and fatter as well. And it's thought that actually um, our hybrid bluebells are probably under-recorded. A lot of people assume that if it's not a native bluebell, it will be a Spanish bluebell. Um, but apparently there are actually more widespread hybrids between the native and the Spanish. And there are actually not that many pure Spanish bluebells um, out and about in the countryside. But that was just a little aside about, about bluebells. As I was walking along, I managed to um, kind of really tune my eyes into little pops of colour to see what I could see um, and just start to get my kind of brain engaged in, in thinking, oh, what species are around? And, and the first thing that usually jumps out is any little pop of colour in amongst the greens and browns. So the one on the top left there, um, I was a little surprised to see it in flower because I didn't think it came out till later on in the year, which shows how wrong I was. Uh, and that one is called green alkanet, um, although I always think it should be blue alkanet because of the blue flowers. But it's green alkanet and it's in the borage family. And actually, once I got my eye in, I then started spotting the leaves of the plant where it wasn't quite flowering yet, all the way around when I was on my walk, uh, all the way back in people's gardens and just in little um, patches by the side of the pavement. The one in the middle is in the dead nettle family. Uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that later on. And this one is red dead nettle, and it's, but it's got that nettle shaped leaf. And that was just a little pop of pink that I spotted out about on my walk. Top right is lesser celandine, and we'll go into detail of this one, but that's one I always look out for as one of the early signs of spring. It's that pop of yellow um, that you suddenly start to see and you know that um, spring is on the way. The bottom left one there, I spotted a small violet. Uh, I didn't get down on my hands and knees to identify it. And again, we'll go into more detail a little bit later on about violets. Um, but I just, for the moment, took a quick picture just to show you uh, and just, yeah, uh, enjoyed that little tiny delicate pop of purple as I was walking through the park. And then the final image on this page is a one called Colt's Foot. Uh, and that's this, um, an interesting plant, flowering plant, where actually the flower spike comes up first. So you don't get leaves to start with, you get the flower up first. and It's quite a fleshy, um, wide stem. And then you get this single dandelion-like flower at the top. And then once it's finished flowering, you then get the leaf coming on afterwards, which is where it gets its name because the leaf is almost like a hoof, like a colt's foot shape. Uh, and that's a plant that likes, well, likes disturbed ground. Um, so you often do spot it in unlikely places as you're out and about and walk. 
but a little pop of yellow that superficially looks like it might be a dandelion, but look a bit closer and it doesn't have the leaves of dandelion. In fact, it doesn't have any leaves at all at the moment. But this time of year, um, even if things aren't in flower, um, it's a good opportunity to start to get your eye in and maybe have a practice that's in vegetative ID. Uh, and we've talked about using keys in previous sessions. Um, so do um, take a look back at the, the YouTube sessions that are on the LRWT YouTube page um, if you're interested and you, know, you missed them. Um, but the one about keys, we were definitely talking about using all sorts of different characteristics to identify a plant. Uh, and there are books, there's one by a guy called uh, Poland and Clement called The Vegetative Key to the British Flora. And that's really great because it doesn't rely on plants being in flower, but it takes you through the leaves and the vegetative characteristics to identify a plant. So it's a good time of year, and I mention that because actually, if you know where a certain plant is and you have a go at identifying it when it's not in flower, um, then you can always go back in a few weeks' time uh, and see if it's grown a little bit more or if it's come into flower, uh, and then you can confirm or kind of re-evaluate your identification. Um, so it's a really good chance if you want to take the opportunity to have a go, but knowing that it won't be long before you can come back, see it a bit more developed and see if you're right or not. I'll certainly be doing that with this middle species here with the sort of the um, heart-shaped leaves, which um, to me look like a plant called garlic mustard. And I know that's quite an early plant, um, but when it's a bit more uh, mature and when it starts to flower, the leaves are often more pointed. So I was, I was undecided, but it looked most like that to me. Uh, and then I can go back in a few weeks time, see how it's developed uh, and make sure that I was right. The one on the left there is common nettle. Um, and it is worth taking a look at that. And as I said, we'll look at dead nettles as well later on. Um, be very careful not to get too close. I often find the very young nettles the most potent in terms of stinging, um, um, but it's a good idea to really get to grips with what is a stinging common nettle and what is a dead nettle that doesn't sting um, and avoid any painful encounters. On the top right there, um, we're starting to get some of the umbellifer family coming through or the carrot family. Uh, and these are kind of frilly leaves that come up uh, and then you get, um, when it flowers, you get these big white umbrella-like heads of different flowers. And there's quite a few different species, but they're quite good at spreading themselves out over the year so they don't fall all into flower at the same time. Um, so you can have a go at identifying an earlier one, checking the book which ones might be flowering earlier and which ones might be flowering later, uh, and see if you know which one it is. I believe this might be cow parsley, um, but there are a few others that it could be as well at this stage. I didn't get down on my hands and knees with my book to take a real close look at this one. And then the one on the bottom right uh, is quite a distinctive plant, these arrow shaped leaves um, that have come up, but there's no flowering part associated with it at the moment. Um, but this one is going to be Lords and Ladies. It is Lords and Ladies. Um, if any of you are familiar with that, you get a spike with almost red berry-like kind of fruiting flowers on it um, that come up a bit later on. Uh, but that's a familiar woodland plant. Um, if you're out and about, you might start to spot the leaves and then later on look out for the flowering spikes. Hopefully you'll have noticed um, buds bursting into life uh, around you at the moment. Um, kind of maybe some of the willow species um, where you get uh, these lovely sort of soft gray, the pussy willow buds starting to blossom, start to get a bit of pollen coming through. Um, the one in the middle there is elder. Uh, and again, if any of you were at the winter tree, um, kind of winter twigs and buds session, um, which I think was, was that December or January? It's on, the, it's on the YouTube channel anyway. We talked about elders having this kind of almost pineapple like bud um, where you start to get the little sprouts at the top um, but now hopefully you can see that as the leaves come out it kind of looks even more like the pineapple the green, the green bit is bursting out of the buds there so we've got some elder on the way and on the right there we've got one of the thorn species looks like blackthorn um, which is about to burst into bud um, interesting about the thorns blackthorn and hawthorn with the blackthorn um, it tends to be the blossom that comes through first so if you're seeing a big showy kind of frothy white swathe often along the roadside um, on kind of that sort of scrubby hedgerowy species. Um, at this time of year it's likely to be the blackthorn that will come through first and then later on the blackthorn will be into leaf and then the hawthorn which is starting to come into leaf now will then flower a bit later on. So actually any insects that are going after these, um, these kind of flowers for a source of nectar and pollen um, have that kind of longer season to go at it so they can start off with blackthorn and then continue on with hawthorn because um, they don't flower quite at the same time, they're a little bit staggered. And speaking of blossom, um, hopefully all around you, you'll have started to notice the cherry blossom um, exploding into life, whether it's one of the more native um, cherries in the wider countryside 
or the planted cherries that are often street trees, um, the kind of more pinky coloured ones. Uh, but this is certainly what I'm smelling uh, and what I'm seeing a lot of. Uh, I'm really feeling like that's, uh, that's showing us um, signs that spring is on the way. Um, so keep an eye out. Um, and the difference in timings of the different blossoms will give you an indication as to what species you're looking at, um, but even before the leaves come out. Um, so you can uh, take a closer look at those if you want to, or you can just sit back and enjoy the blossoms, wait for the leaves, uh, and then maybe have a bit better idea of what species it is you're looking at. And now just before we move on to the um, kind of the, the, the meat of the, of the flowering um, plants and the identification tips, um, I just wanted to um, give you a bit of a background on a, a, um, something, a term that we call phenology in the kind of the conservation world. Uh, and this is the study of seasonal changes in plants. It's about kind of how early or late things occur each year uh, and the variation from year to year. You've probably heard of it before that, oh, I've heard the first cuckoo calling or um, oh, the first um, blackberry is actually ripened later in the year. Uh, and there is actually, it's, you know, it's a science and it's a study and it helps us to track what's happening in terms of weather and climate change. Uh, and if you're really interested, there's a, a great site called Nature's Calendar. Uh, and actually it tells you the things that um, they are interested in recording um, to help understand what is going on in terms of this phenology. Uh, and you get the opportunity to report your sightings and see how, you know, who else has reported their sightings at different times of year for all different species. So if you're interested in that, um, then do look up Nature's Calendar. Um, and it just is, it, it's one of those things that a lot of people, oh, I saw my first bumblebee or we were very excited in the trust because the first osprey had arrived back um, at Rutland Water uh, this week, which was great news uh, and just always a really nice thing to see. And it's interesting to know whether it was a similar time of year to previous years, a bit earlier or a bit later and kind of track that over time and you can see if things are trending earlier um, or trending later. So on to the spring flowers, um, part of the part of the, uh, of the session. So um, hopefully that was a little bit of a rundown of um, some other things to think about in spring, a um, bit of encouragement to just to go out and enjoy it, um, as well as get out and, and see if you can't dust off anything that might be a bit of a rusty skill um, and start to think, all right, I can really start noticing the leaves or the flowers or the buds uh, and start to think, all right, okay, you can get, yeah, get your eye in uh, and work out what you might be identifying uh, ready to get, get on with recording. So the first few um, species we're gonna look at, um, you'll probably find in woodland settings, uh, we're looking at um, plants with white flowers to start with. And there are a few um, that superficially you might think are a little bit similar, um, but we'll take you through those uh, and hopefully you'll be able to understand the subtle differences between them. Um, and then if you're out and about having a lovely stroll through the woodlands and um, start to be on the lookout for all of these species. The first one is wood sorrel, Oxalis acetosella. Uh, and it's got these distinctive trefoil, um, just about three, um, groups of three, heart-shaped leaves. And they come off a stem and on a separate stem, you then get white flowers um, and there's five petals with purple veins. So you're looking at five petals coming up off a single stem. And you're looking at these kind of three parts, almost clover like leaves, if you like, um, kind of three part shaped leaves. And then uh, at night, the leaves and the flowers actually fold up. So it almost looks like it's putting itself to bed. You can see, hopefully, the image on the bottom right there. Um, they're a little bit closed up, but then uh, during the day, they kind of flatten out and take advantage of the sunlight um, that's coming through. Uh, and that's um, something to think about as well is a lot of these um, species that flower early. Um, are our woodland species uh, and they're in flower before the trees have really sprouted and had a chance to get that um, leaf cover because uh, once that happens the canopy cover will be closed and there will be much less light reaching the floor of the woodland. So a lot of the early species are the ones that take advantage um, in the woodland um, of that time where there is more light coming through, a bit more warmth and there's some early warmth in the soil that's had a bit more shelter um, over the winter than more exposed areas uh, and they take advantage of that and get on as early as possible and kind of carry on and almost finish their life cycle or their flowering life cycle quite early. But so then later on in the year, when we get out to the summer, that's when we start to look more at the open kind of grassland um, flowering species um, that don't have to be as early to the party um, because it's not the same in terms of the kind of clothing if they're not under the trees. So wood sorrel, um, as its name suggests, woodlands and sometimes hedgerows, um, it's in bloom around Easter time, so one of the other names some people call it is Alleluia. Um, and it shouldn't be confused with other sorrels. Um, so there are two other sorrel species you might find, um, common sorrel and sheep sorrel. 
Um, but those two are in the Dock family, Rumex, uh, and they're very different. Um, wood sorrel is a family on its own. Um, and there is another little yellow um, flowered sorrel type species that you might spot more of a, a weed growing in the pavement cracks. Um, but this one, the white one, the wood sorrel, is something you'll probably only find in, in a really nice woodland um, or in a kind of an older hedgerow quite established. So that one's wood sorrel. So one that superficially probably looks a little bit similar to wood sorrel, but another woodland plant, um, as its name again suggests, is wood anemone, uh, a low growing plant. But this time you're looking for six or more petals. You've got more petals um, than the wood sorrel. It's got these clusters of yellow anthers in the center of the flower. And the leaves are deeply lobed. You don't have that heart shaped leaf, you have that kind of almost feathered lobes. Uh, and one of those is a whirl of three leaves halfway up the stem with a flower on top. Hopefully you can just make that out from the image on the right. So whereas the wood sorrel came up and the flower was on a separate stem on the wood anemone, um, you get this whirl of three leaves and then you get the flower atop the stem. We're looking at March to May time approximately. All of these flowering times are approximate. You may get some earlier or later, um, depending on where they are, if they're in a particularly warm and sheltered spot or an exposed location if it's a particularly warm spring or a cold spring. Um, so this, the flowering times can vary. Wood anemone uh, spreads via root growth, uh, and it's actually named after the Greek god of the wind, Anemos. And apparently he said anemones in spring to herald his arrival. So hence uh, another name for the wood anemone is wind flower, which I think is quite nice. So that's two of our quite similar sort of star shaped um, white flowers, quite delicate um, that you'll find in the woodland. The third one to have a look at um, is one called Greater Stitchwort, uh, another woodland plant. It has stems that are square, so if you rub them between your fingers, um, they're, quite, um, they're square and quite brittle. The leaves of Greater Stitchwort are more grass-like, so they're thinner, um, one of the terms might be lanceolate, a bit like a spear, and they're in pairs and they're at right angles to each other. Uh, and the edge of these leaves is um, feels quite rough. So if you look under the hand lens, you can see that it's rough. The petals of greater stitchwort, um, it looks like more, but it's actually five petals. And they're so deeply notched, uh, almost into two, that it looks like you might see 10 petals. Um, but it's five petals, deeply notched. And they're two to three centimetres across. Uh, and it's usually flowering around April and through to June. It is a relative of a plant which is smaller called lesser stitchwort. So um, if you see something that's smaller with flowers that are really only like half to one centimetre, um, then you might have lesser stitchwort. Um, also the leaves of lesser stitchwort on the edge are smooth, so you don't have that rough edge to them um, like the greater stitchwort. Another name for this plant is wedding cakes, star of Bethlehem and snapdragon. And so lots of different common names. Um, snapdragon um, is thought potentially because of the brittle stems, because they snap so easily. Um, so if you're looking at this one, um, worth taking extra care um, to not snap the stems um, because they're so brittle. So that one is greater stitchwort, the third of our white flowering um, kind of early spring um, woodland species. Moving on, we've got um, another one which is called woodruff, and this is in the gallium family um, or the bed straws. Um, again, a woodland plant. And again, um, like the stitchwort, it's got these square stems. And so if you rub them kind of longitudinally between your fingers, you'll feel that the angles um, are like ridging, bumping round, you feel that it's not a rounded stem. And again, the leaves are in whorls, but there's more leaves. Uh, and these are six to nine and they're narrow, lanceolate, um, so spear shaped again. And you're looking out for a tiny spike at the end of the leaf. Um, you may need to get a hand lens, get down close, up on your hands and knees, um, and see if you can spot um, the tiny spike on the end of the leaves. The flowers are white and they're funnel shaped um, with four lobes. Uh, and they're sort of said to be an umbel like head. So you get a stem coming up with then several um, flowers coming off that stem. So the umbrella kind of type um, approach, um, very different family to the carrot family, to the rest of the umbellifers. Um, but it just describes the way that the flower heads are. So they're not singly on stems, there's more than one flower there. Uh, May to June is the approximate flowering time. Uh, and after they've um, flowered, the fruits have these hooked black tipped bristles and these little tiny two to three millimeter fruits. Um, so that's worth looking out for. If you crush it, um, it's said to smell a bit like vanilla, um, which is another reason why it's also known as sweet woodruff. 
Um, so potentially that kind of sweet vanillary scent. Uh, I've not smelt it myself, but I'd be interested to know um, if that's the case. Um, sometimes it's one of those quite subjective things um, with what flowers are supposed to smell like. But sweet woodruff, woodruff, um, potentially with a vanilla scent when crushed. There are other bed straws, um, so it could be confused um, with um, something like a hedge bed straw, but that would tend to be more in hedgerows. Heath bed straw, which is a very fine plant, um, and you really would see that in a, more open heathlands. Uh, and the one that is more widespread probably, and a, and a bit of a pest in the garden, is cleavers or goose grass, also called sticky weed. And that's the bed straw you might know. Um, it's got these almost like Velcro light hooks that make it feel sticky. Uh, and when that um, finishes flowering, you get the green um, uh, sort of prickly balls that stick to everything, um, your trousers, your pets, anything. Um, so um, it's the same family, but for woodruff, it's more delicate. You're looking out for these leaves with a tiny point on them. Um, and woodruff doesn't have that um, sticky um, kind of Velcro like feel to the stems like cleavers does. Um, so it's all the same family, but um, subtle differences there. Um, so it'd be good to keep an eye out for woodruff. I said we'd come back to, to lesser celandine. I'll just um, talk through a few ID tips so that you can uh, be certain of what you're, what you're spotting. Um, it is quite distinctive. There's not a lot else happening at this time of year that looks like lesser celandine. And it's a real characteristic plant of woodlands, hedgerows and parks. It's quite widespread. Sometimes you'll get this carpet of the glossy green heart-shaped leaves first. Um, they can be quite varied in size. Um, but then you get these bright yellow star-like flowers. Um, we're looking at eight to 12 petals, um, particularly opening up in the sunlight. So lesser celandine ranunculus ficaria is in the buttercup family, so that's ranunculus. Um, there is a plant called greater celandine and it's not related at all, they just have a similar name. Uh, it's certainly been in flower at the moment because I've spotted it already, um, usually through till May. And it's a great early nectar source for insects. Um, so if insects are coming out of hibernation, um, then um, it's really um, key that they've got um, a nectar source early on to help them kind of get that kick start and into their life cycle. So um, that as another element of phenology is a kind of how things are timing together. Um, for example, if um, birds are breeding particularly early, um, but actually the caterpillars um, that they might feed the young on um, aren't ready, aren't, haven't emerged, um, then there's that kind of um, disconnect um, between the two and then the birds might have a poor season but um, on the flip side of that actually if the caterpillars aren't being predated by the, the, kind of the blue tits um, then they might have a better year um, but in an ideal world if uh, nature is able to do what it's evolved to do naturally is that these things happen um, in the right sort of time and, and it's that's the kind of the concept of the food web where actually everything is interconnected and, and if the timing of one thing um, is out because um, of some kind of human intervention or some kind of climate issue um, then that can actually have an impact kind of further down the chain it's not just um, that particular species if it's delayed in its uh, reproductive cycle it could have a knock-on effect all the way through. So on to another yellow species um, very much a woodland plant yellow archangel <clears throat> and this is in the dead nettle family so um, I talked a little bit about dead nettles um, right at the start. Um, so superficially, they look quite like nettles. They've got those same kind of oblong to triangular leaves, very toothed, um, so very kind of jagged edges. Um, could be mistaken for stinging nettle, apart from it's got these um, yellow hooded uh, flowers um, with orange kind of to red brown streaks. So they're quite distinctive and quite pretty if you um, look up close to them. Um, hairy plant, it's a perennial uh, and it's really an ancient woodland plant. Um, so it's got these two leaves of the dead nettles uh, and they've all got these square stems as well. So um, it's kind of one of those diagnostic things of looking at a stem uh, is looking at what shape it is, looking at whether it's hairy or not. And a lot of your ID guides um, will kind of take you through the detail of that. And it can be quite important um, to get to that level of detail um, to tell the difference between particular species. But this one yet, yeah, so a square stem um, and in flower May to June time. Uh, now there is a, a non-native variety, um, a kind of a garden escape of the yellow archangel, um, which is variegated yellow archangel. Uh, and this one, the leaves have these sort of silver streaks, they're kind of dark green and silver. Um, and it is a problem species like most of our invasives, because what happens is it spreads rapidly. It's quite a robust plant and it can outcompete the native woodland flora. 
Um, so you get all this variegated yellow archangel and it just it obliterates everything else. So it can be a problem um, as many of our kind of garden escapes um, do, do kind of cause this similar issue. But the native version yellow archangel is a lovely one to see. Um, it tends to come into flower after the bluebells are finished. So it's kind of the next one um, that comes along in the ancient woodlands. You, 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 the, all the blue is finished and then you start to get these, these yellow spikes coming up. So they're in almost in whirls um, all the way up the stem uh, of these yellow hooded flowers, really quite pretty. Now primrose is one we looked at in some detail. Again, when we were looking at our using keys um, uh, webinar um, a few months back. Um, and it is quite a familiar plant. You'll see it out and about quite a lot. You'll see quite a lot of cultivated varieties as well, different colours and different shapes and sizes. Um, but the native primrose, a familiar plant of hedgerows, woodland clearings, grassland and gardens, it's really quite widespread. It's one of those plants that actually, if it's mild, could be in flower from December. Um, and there's certainly um, quite a few primroses in flower around me um, already. It's a very low growing plant uh, and the tongue like leaves are wrinkled so you get the rosette of that you can see and spot quite early on. And then you get each flower born on a single quite woolly stalk um, and these large creamy yellow flowers, you're talking three to four centimetres across um, with a dark yellow centre. Uh, and the petal lobes each have this shallow notch in the middle, so they're kind of almost heart shaped. Um, April the 19th, which is not too far away, um, apparently is known as Primrose Day, which is very nice. I didn't know that before I was doing some research for this presentation. Uh, apparently in honour of, ben honor of Benjamin Disraeli, uh, who knew, I didn't know we had a national Primrose Day. Um, but it's a lovely, pretty little flower. Uh, and again, one of those signs of spring that you know that uh, the seasons are changing and, and the warmer weather's on the way. I think the final yellow flower to talk to you about today is called Yellow Pimpernel. Um, this is um, one that um, I don't think I've ever seen in the wild, um, but then I haven't particularly gone looking for it. But it's an evergreen perennial uh, and we're looking at damp, quite shady places, so woodland again. If you look on the photo on the left there, um, the leaves are opposite each other on the stem and they're oval and quite pointed. Uh, and then what you get um, is from the base of those leaves, um, where it meets the stem, is that's where the flower stalk comes up. Uh, and that, that kind of comes up to these bright yellow five lobed flowers. I think they're quite star shaped. Whenever I see a pimpernel, um, then it's, it's really little tiny stars that you see. Um, and um, five lobes, um, kind of, and then just a really nice bright yellow colour. A little bit later on, flowering May to September. Um, it's quite a low growing plant and it sort of creeps along the ground and it can be up to 40 centimetres long. Um, it's said that it can be confused with creeping jenny, which is in the same family. Uh, but Creeping Jenny, the photo in the middle there, has broader blunt leaves, shorter flower stalks, uh, and the flowers are um, kind of chunkier and they're not quite so delicate and star-like as the yellow pimpernel. And then I've just popped a photo of another pimpernel there on the right, which is scarlet pimpernel, and that's more a plant of kind of disturbed areas and arable field edges. Um, and it's the same sort of shaped flower, the little um, star-shaped flower, but scarlet pimpernel, as its name suggests, is often scarlet. Um, although confusingly, there are some hybrids um, that are almost purpley blue flowered. Um, but if you're looking out for this little tiny star shaped flower, whether it's yellow, whether it's red, or whether it's sort of a bluey color, um, you might want to start your investigation with your ID guides um, with the pimpernels. So onto a couple of blue type flowers, blue to purple type flowers now. Uh, and this one, another woodland plant is wood speedwell. So we're talking the Veronicas, and this is Veronica Montana. Um, and it likes damp woodland and shaded places. Uh, it's a low sprawling plant and it's softly hairy. And the key thing is that the stems are hairy all around. Um, so you do need to get quite close to decide if you've got wood speed well and probably um, using a hand lens um, to really take a close look. You can't always see um, the hairiness of stems with a naked eye. It's got pale lilac flowers and you get darker streaks. Uh, and these flowers are in what we call racemes, which is just another word for spikes. So you get a spike of several flowers together and they come from the, the base of the leaf. So a bit like the pimpernel, um, so the flower spike is, is growing out of the base of the, where the leaf it, uh, attaches to the stem. It's in flower April to July, um, so perhaps not quite yet, although you might see it in some more um, kind of sheltered areas. A couple of other speed wells that you might come across, and the reason I was talking about um, the 
reading the hand lens to look for the stems and the hairiness is one that's called Jamanda Speedwell. And the stem of this plant um, has two rows of hairs opposite each other on the stem. Just excuse me while I take a glass of water. <coughs> yeah, so Jamanda Speedwell um, has this stem with two rows of hairs. So if you look under the hand lens, you can clearly see the stairs don't go all the, the hairs don't go all the way around. So two rows, whereas the wood speedwell near the hairy stem um, kind of goes all the way around. So really important one to have a look out for. And perhaps if you're out on more open heathland, you might spot heath speedwell. The leaves have got shallow teeth and the flowers are in denser voting, um, but that is likely to be out sort of in a more open habitat. Um, whereas the wood speedwell, um, you really will find more in a damp kind of shaded place. So when you're doing identification and there are lots of similar species, so it's not just how the plant looks, but it's where it is, where are you finding it? And that can often be a really good hint as to what species it is. Um, but do think about um, taking a closer look and start thinking about taking a hand lens or um, taking um, really good photos um, out, in, out in the field with you. Um, but yeah, probably that um, down on your hands and knees, unfortunately, and really looking closely through a lens is probably one of the main ways of um, identifying and separating some similar species such as the speed wells. And then another blue one that I promised you we'd talk about a little bit more, um, the violets and the violas. Um, and um, this one is common dog violet. Um, so I thought I'd take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the violets uh, and the, the things you need to look out for um, to give you a hint as to um, which species you might be looking at. But common dog violet, which is this one, um, is one of several species. This is quite widespread woodland, heathland, grassland. Um, it's in flower April to June and it doesn't have a scent. So again, um, getting quite close to it and having a, having a smell, um, the common dog violet is not scented. The flowers are kind of purple bluish, um, heart shaped and the leaves too. They're heart shaped with long stalked leaves. But what's important in identifying violets is this side on view. Uh, and what I uh, managed to find was, uh, if any of you have the Wild Flower Key, which is a book by Francis Rose, um, there's this image in there that takes you through um, the parts of the violet flower, which I think is really quite um, helpful. Um, and the things to look out for um, often is that number eight, which is the spur. Uh, and hopefully you can see from the photograph, the spur on the right there is quite pale. It's paler than the rest of the petals, it's almost white. Uh, and it points upwards. Um, so it doesn't point um, kind of along the stem, but it's, it's got this curved upwards. Um, it's probably a bit difficult to make out, but it does have a little notch in the end as well. So the color and the shape uh, and whether the, um, um, the spur is notched or not is a diagnostic factor. Uh, and if you've got one that's curved upwards, it's pale white and has a notch, um, then that's a clue to the common dog violet. Now the sepals, which numbered in the, um, in the picture are four. Um, they're the, the parts that um, point to the right, so point along towards the petals. And the sepals of the common dog violet are long and pointed. And some of the other violet species, um, they won't be pointed and they won't be so long. And then the sepal appendages, sorry, we're going into quite technical terms today, um, but that's number three on the diagram. Um, and they point back the other way towards the stem. And um, the sepal appendages um, and the common dog violet are quite long. Um, they go kind of rounded. Um, and when I say quite long, we're talking millimetres, more than one and a half millimetres, whereas compared to some of the other violets, um, these are longer and some of the other violets have shorter sepal appendages. So if you're unsure about violets, a side on image and a really good side on image, um, plus um, some images of um, the whole plant, including the leaves, would be really important. Um, other violets you might come across, the sweet violet, and that's the one that does have a scent. There's an early dog violet um, where the spur is darker and straight. Then there's heath violet, and then there's also hairy violet, um, plus a whole host of hybrids just to confuse us. Um, so um, it can be confusing uh, if you're not sure. Um, do take a photo. You're always welcome to submit it via Nature Spot um, or any of the other kind of um, iRecord type um, apps. Um, and I'm sure if you've got the photo that they can make it out from, they'd be happy to confirm um, if they can, um, which species of violet you might have. 
So our final species of our kind of whistle stop tour um, of spring flowers is probably one that you wouldn't think of as a flower. Um, and it, it, it's a sedge, so it's a flowering plant, um, but perhaps not one with sort of petals and sepals and, and, and things you might um, associate with um, some of the other flowers you've come across uh, they can have the same coloration. Um, but it is one um, that's a woodland plant. It's a bit late flowering, June to July, um, but hopefully um, you might spot this in some of the Charnwood woodlands. Um, it forms large tussocks um, up to 70 centimetres across with um, one or two male spikelets uh, at the tip and they're up to 10 centimetres long. Uh, and that's the kind of the broader, fluffier um, parts that you can see there. And then the female spikelets, there's four or five of those spread out lower down. Um, so they're the thinner, narrower, but longer um, spikelets. So it's quite obviously drooping, these spikelets, or pendulous. So hence the name pendulous sedge uh, and carex pendula. So the scientific name is quite descriptive um, for this one. All the sedges or most of the sedges are carex as the family. Um, the stems, and I'll talk about this a bit more in a minute. The stems are triangular. So if you roll them between your fingers, you will get that kind of um, uh, ridged um, and three ridges. So you get that triangular section. Uh, it's also known as weeping sedge or hanging sedge. Uh, and that's um, quite obvious. Again, it's that drooping, it's that pendulous um, look to it. So sedge, grass-like flowering plant, and it's related to rushes and grasses. But there is a little rhyme um, that I always use to give me a hint um, as to whether I'm looking at a sedge, a rush or a grass. Uh, and it's this, it's sedges have edges, rushes are round, grasses have nodes from the top to the ground. And um, so, um, what this is referring to is if you can imagine taking a stem and cutting it crossways. Um, if you're looking at a sedge, you'll have that triangle shape. If you're looking at a rush, it will be round and solid or with pith in the middle. But if you're looking at grasses, they tend to have hollow stems, um, but they do have these nodes, almost like joints, elbows or knee joints. As you go up the stem, you can often find these nodes which are solid, but then in between it's hollow and round. So sedges have edges, rushes around, grasses have nodes from the top to the ground. Like any of these, there are exceptions to every rule. Um, so, but it, it's a good starting point to know um, what am I looking at? Um, have a good look at the stem, roll it between your fingers uh, and see, um, see what you feel um, that you're getting. Um, a, a bit of a hint as to where you might start if you wanted to look it up in a key or another ID guide. So I can see there are some um, comments in the chat box, which we'll get to in a second, but um, that's um, kind of the end of the species for today. So we've actually been through 12 species and looked at um, some other signs of spring. Hopefully that's been interesting. Um, thank you very much for you know, continuing to, to join these sessions. Uh, and as I said, hopefully we'll be out and about and doing some field based sessions very soon. Um, but the next session, just to give you a heads up in advance, is an introduction to common bird songs. Um, so we still like to be using our other senses and, and listening um, and seeing if we can't um, understand um, a bit more about um, the birds that you hear. Uh, and that is a different day and time. Um, so do look out for that. It's a Thursday this time, the 7th of April, and it will be at 10 o'clock on Zoom. I'll send around the link um, so um, you can um, get signed up to that if you're available. And as before, it will be uh, recorded uh, and we'll pop it on our um, YouTube channel afterwards. Following that in May, um, we're hoping to be able to offer um, a field session to actually listen to some bird songs out in the field with one of our experts. We will be able to um, kind of just have a walk and a talk and, and really listen out to some bird songs in the field. So hopefully some of you will be able to join us for that as well. So I hope that's been interesting. Um, as I said, there's some, there's some questions in the chat. Um, so I will stop um, sharing my screen and um, put my video back on and then I can pick up the chat hopefully and um, see where we're at. Okay, let me just um, stop the share. There we go. Pop my video on. Hopefully you can see me. Um, good afternoon, everybody. And let me just pull up the chat uh, and see where we're at. So I'll go down these and then um, be thinking if you've got any other questions while we're, while we're going through these uh, and then feel free to either pop your video on or wave your hand or give me some kind of indication if you've got a question. Um, so Julie, is there a link to the um, YouTube to see previous sessions? Um, I will certainly send that round. 
um, no problem at all. But in the meantime, you just go onto YouTube and if you um, search for Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust, and they'll all come up and all of the um, species recording sessions are quite high up the list because they're quite new. So hopefully you can see that, but I will um, email everybody after this with links and bits and pieces. Um, Kate, um, are there any spring rarities that if we see them, we should report them? Um, to be honest, any of, the, any of the species that you come across that are in flower, um, take a note of them. Um, the whole idea of the kind of the recording is, um, it's just not just about rarities, it's the common ones as well. Um, but um, probably I wouldn't pick out anything in particular. Um, and you know, if you're not sure and you think something might be a bit rare, then do get in touch um, with ourselves or do get in touch with Nature Spot. Um, and they'd be happy to um, to take your record and 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 see what and, and let you know about the um, kind of the distribution and the rareness of that particular species. Uh, what kind of loop do you recommend, Rose? Um, so a loop on one of the um, uh, what was I calling them? Hand lens. Um, and I don't know if you'd be able to see. Um, I've got one here. Um, sorry, my camera's a bit rubbish, so it's probably not going to focus very well. Anyway, um, it's. Um, you can uh, you kind of you basically you uh, I'd put it in front of my face that's better isn't it um, so it's got a lens and you can kind of fold it away when it's not in use it's kind of personal preference um, there are lots of different ones you don't have to spend loads of money um, a 10 times zoom a 10 times one um, in terms of magnification is probably sufficient um, if you get um, ones that are too strong they're actually almost harder to use because your field of vision is very very narrow a bit like a camera Kind of the more zoomed in you get the less amount of focus you've got um, you can get ones that have got the sort of double ended so you've got a um, two different um, levels of zoom um, on two different lenses but on one kind of one actual um, piece of kit um, so but you don't have to spend a lot um, but yeah 10 times maybe to start with and then if you think you need to get more detail then you could go up to 15 or 20 um, times zoom Kate, um, what do we do if on common council LRWT trust land, see an invasive such as variegated yellow archangel, do we pull it up? Um, the short answer to that is no. Um, and if you're on any land where it's not your own property, then um, you shouldn't pull up any plant um, without permission. Um, so that's the kind of um, first and foremost rule, even if you think you're doing good and very well meaning that you shouldn't pull it up to, uh, without permission. Um, but um, absolutely um, let the landowner know uh, and you know, feel free to offer some help to um, if they feel that they want to um, work on a way of eradicating it, then you may be able to help them out with that. But yes, definitely alert people to it um, if you know who the landowner is. Um, but um, without permission, um, don't take it into your own hands to do that. Um, there may be um, no reasons for not pulling it or pulling it. Uh, and they may have um, kind of a, a scheme underway. And there are certain invasive plants that you wouldn't want to touch uh, and that some have to be removed by a particular means. And also there are regulations about how you dispose of um, some invasive species. Um, you can't, you're not allowed to take them off site because it's controlled waste. Um, so a few different rules and regulations and pitfalls, but yes, if you've spotted them, absolutely fantastic to keep an eye out and let people know. Uh, and then you may well be able to um, kind of be part of uh, any efforts to deal with those if necessary. So that was our four in the chat. Have I got anything from anybody else? Uh, Sue, Sue, would you like to unmute yourself? Hi, Claire. Thank you Hi, very Sue. much for a lovely uh, presentation. Um, I think whatever else is going on in the world, it's always wonderful to get a bit of optimism with the spring coming <laughs> forward. So, uh, yes, thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, it was just a, an observation, really. Um, I know uh, many people will be familiar with um, the Swithland Woods area, um, but if anybody is particularly interested, there's, a, there's an area within Swithland Woods called Stocking Wood, um, which in April and May time is absolutely wonderful for a lot of the wildflowers that you have been talking about uh, this afternoon. Um, and there's one particular patch where if you really, if you just catch the timing right, uh, you can see bluebell, archangel, yellow archangel, um, ramsons, the wild garlic, 
um, and red campion all all together, all flowering at the same time, and it's absolutely beautiful. So I would recommend it if, um, if people want to go there. And uh, it's also quite a good area for yellow pimpernel and pendulous sedge as well. Brilliant. Uh, oh. Just an observation, but um, just thought I'd mention that. Thank you, Sue. That's really helpful. Now, um, sort of knowing those kind of particular areas areas is, is really helpful. So Swithin and Woods near to Bradgate Park, if anybody's not sure, do drop me a message and I can um, point you in the right direction. Um, but yeah, um, anybody who knows <laughs> particularly good areas, yeah, it's great to get out. And if you know there are certain species there, you can go and practice, get your eye in. Uh, and then when you're out and about in the more kind of wider environment, you might just spot them um, if you've already had a chance to have a good close look at them yourself. So brilliant. Thanks for that tip, Sue. Anybody else? I think I can see you all on my screen, so I don't think there's anybody hiding and trying to wave at me. I'm just going to check. Uh, no, we're a little bit earlier today. Um, I've obviously um, talked quite quickly, so apologies for that. Um, so um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I will send round um, the link to the YouTube video and other bits and pieces. It probably won't be till next week. It does take a while for the, the recording to come through to us. Um, but I will email everybody um, with that. Uh, and also we'll be sending around the, the link to the, the next sign up. Uh, remember, that's on a Thursday morning as opposed to our Wednesday lunchtime slots that we've been doing. Um, but thanks all very much for joining us. Uh, any questions, comments, do feel free to get in touch with me. Always great to hear from you all um, and get out and enjoy the spring. Sorry, Kate, did you have something you wanted to add there? So I wasn't <laughs> sure if that was a wave or a high. It was. <laughs> Something's just occurred to me that um, I'm doing a churchyard project and we have forget me not. Um, can you tell me a quick way to tell the difference between the different types of forget me not, the garden escapee or the wood or ooh, um, hand lens um, and get your and get your ID guide out, definitely. It's um, a really tricky one, head. is it? it? The forget me nots are quite tricky, a bit like the speed wells, but you do need to get get your lens out. Um, and look at um, um, kind of really quite detailed characteristics. Um, right, so it's if, not you've easy. Got an, if you've got an ID guide, um, have a look through, uh, look at the different ones it could be, think about what habitat you're in, if it's in a churchyard, is it a more shaded kind of one? So try and take all of that into account. If you're still struggling, um, send us some images uh, and a bit more description and we'll see if we can help. Thank you. All right, okay. thanks. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks everybody. I will finish with there and uh, hopefully see you all next time. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.